starting with the handout on page one, the importance of passwords. So it's important to ensure your staff regularly update their password to make that secure and they can do that by going to file and change password. So they need, just need to type in their old password and the new password and verify that and click OK. Um, MedTech stores information in the audit tab of many of the windows, so whoever's logged in, it's going to audit that that person was the one that did the change or last updated it. The other thing I would encourage is you to use the Control F12, so when you use Control F12, you'll actually come to this window here and they need to log back in again to be able to get back in, so it, if they're moving away from their desk, it's a really good idea to use Control and F12 just to secure the screen and make sure nobody else puts entries in under their login. Just looking at searching for patients, now um, when we just choose F2 to search for a patient, we can just, as you know, do the quick search by name, chart number and NHI. Uh, I would encourage you to also look in the advanced search, which I'm sure most of you know about, and you can search for a previous name, street name, city, date of birth. Now, when you're typing in a date of birth, you can just type it in six-digit format. So if you know that somebody um, was born on the 12th of the 10th, um, 1989, you can just do that. You don't need to put dots or um, backslashes or anything, you can just put the six digits in, press the tab key and it will resolve that date for you into the correct format. Um, you can also type in and search by an accident number or an invoice payment reference number. When you're searching, remember to include an active uh, to make sure the patient just hasn't been made an active. That's especially important when you're looking to add a new patient, just make sure they haven't been inactivated. Just a few tips about searching. Uh, when we come to the quick search here, if you have an example of McDonald, for example, you don't know how McDonald is spelt, is it a MC Donald or an MAC Donald, etc. What you can do is use the wildcard, so type in the first letter of the last name and then the wildcard is the asterisk or shift 8 and then the last few letters or the last letter of that surname. So what that will do is going to find me everything that starts with an M and ends in an ALD, so it will find me the McDonald's and the McDonald's etc. So that's useful you know, for kind of Asian names or other names that uh, may be difficult to know how they're spelt. Now, um, when we know a patient's first name, but not their last name, you can put a space in and type in their first name. So if you've just had somebody on the phone and you knew it was John, um, you didn't quite remember the last name, you can just type that in and that might just prompt you to remember, oh yes, it was um, John Frederick or whatever it would be. Now, if I just go to this one here, you notice I've, I've said John here, but it's come up with Tubby Atkins. Now, it's come up with Tubby because that is his preferred name. So if I go into the patient register and look, he is a John, but his preferred name is Tubby. So when we search, we see the preferred name, and we also see the preferred name up on the palette. Okay, um, when you're searching, you can uh, search for a chart number, and you can use the hash key to put that chart number in as well. Uh, if anybody wants to, there is the ability to be able to search for an internal ID. I'm not sure how often you'd need this, but um, sometimes when you're doing things like PHO imports and things, they do refer to internal ID. So every patient has its own internal ID, which you find in the audit tab of the patient register. And um, if you do want to search for that number, it's just a matter of seeing it in there or you know, finding out what it is, and then you can put in a, a hash and an equals and the internal ID number, and it will bring up that patient with that internal ID. Okay, just going to move on to the enrolment funding tab. And this is relevant to GP practices, and it's all about qualifying for PHO funding. So in order to qualify, uh, the patient does need to be registered and the enrolment funding tab needs to show that they've confirmed they want to enrol um, and the date of confirmed has to match that that's on your um, signed patient enrolment form. 
So it's not the date you're putting it in, it's the date of the signed patient enrolment form. And the method of enrolment is form. Okay, now uh, whether or not they qualify for funding relies on whether they've been seen in the last three years. And if we go to the accounts tab, you'll be able to see that um, the date of the last invoice reflects when they've last been seen. And that could be a date in the last three years. If they haven't been seen in the last three years, then as long as they've got a new updated sign enrolment form within the last three years, then they will qualify for funding. Okay, um, just going to move on to appointments and uh, bring up the second appointment book. Dragging and dropping appointments, so uh, the aim of this is just to show you some tips and hints about things that perhaps you might not be aware of, and the fact that you can actually drag and drop appointments. So if Mickey Mouse didn't want to see, um, didn't want to do this appointment here at 10.45 with Sam Eves, rather than cancelling that and making it over here, we can actually just highlight that appointment, and we can see how my mouse point has changed to an eye. We can click and drag that into Barry Beater's appointment and put it into over here. So we can just click that into here and move it over. So it's asking me, am I, do I really want to cancel that appointment? And I'll say yes, because it's cancelling it from one. It's prompting me for a reason, which I'm just going to leave that for now. We'll talk about that later. And it's moved that appointment over there. Okay, just going on to the second page of the handout, if you've got that printed out. You can also use the standard Windows shortcut keys to move and copy appointments. So if I want to move this appointment here, um, perhaps for Jennifer, from 10.30 till 12pm, I can just highlight that appointment. I can do a Control X for copy. Again, it's actually cancelling it and prompting me for a reason. I can then go down to the appointment slot I do want it in and use my control V to paste it in there. If I want to copy an appointment, so say I've got the doctor over here and the nurse over here, I can just highlight that appointment and control C for copy. I can move into the space that I want that appointment, say at 10 a.m. and I can do a uh, control V. So control C copies it and control V pastes it and control X cuts it and control V pastes it. If we have somebody in a spot here, um, so if I just put somebody into this appointment slot and then cancel that appointment, I can just cancel it by clicking up to this icon here. You'll see when I point and hover on that, that it shows the shortcut key for that is Control L and um, I can cancel that, really cancel it. Yes, I'm going to talk about these reasons a bit later on. That cancels it. As soon as I've done that, I have the ability to undo that cancellation by highlighting on that same appointment book, going up to the appointment book menu, and then clicking on undo cancel. Really undo the cancel? Yes. And it puts that patient back into that slot. So some people aren't aware of that, but it does work as long as you do it straight away because it'll only remember the last patient that you've actually cancelled. Um, just going on to 4.5, talking about the appointment overview. So uh, the appointment overview I can get to with uh, this one here. This icon with the appoint the clock and the little page. If you don't have that icon, you can always go to module appointments and appointment overview. What that will do is it'll show you all of the providers. Uh, for that day if we've got it filtered for all providers. If we change that filter to say I just want to see uh, one provider, so I just want to see Sam Eves, it will change the view to show just Sam Eves but it'll show his whole week there. We can just expand that out a bit. So one week's worth of appointments for one provider. However, we'll just flick it back again to all and we can see all providers there. Now it is colour coded, so you'll see there that I've written in what the colour codes are, and that is that grey is unavailable, white is available, blue is booked, and yellow is double booked. Just be careful here, because if you actually click in here, you actually can make an appointment. 
So if I click into any of these spots, I'm actually making an appointment for the patient on the pallet. So I think you just need to be aware of that, and I'm, I'm just not so keen on that method of doing it myself because it's easy to make a mistake, so just be aware of that. Um, just going on to page three of the handout and talking about find free appointment slots in the appointment book. So just minimise that one down. This is useful for doctors or specialists that work limited hours. So if you've got a specialist that only comes in perhaps um, on uh, just you know one day a week for three hours or whatever, if you're wanting to find the next free appointment slot rather than going day to day or flicking through the calendar here, just click on the find next available appointment and it will click and find you the next free appointment for that doctor and then you can come and say find next free appointment slot and it will just keep finding that for you. So it's really good and relevant for specialists etc. Okay, just talking about now on 4.7 just looking at um, appointment cancellations. So you'll notice that when I was doing cancellations for my appointments, uh, I did actually I get prompted. So if I'll just do that again, so if I cancel an appointment, it's prompting me to cancel if I want, really want to cancel that, and then it's asking me for a reason for the cancellation. So I can say um, the reason I'm cancelling it is because the patient didn't arrive. They're configurable, those things, and I'll show you how to set those up. If you do want to set up cancellation reasons, you need to go into Setup, Location, and Location Settings. You need to have access rights to do this, of course. You might need your practice manager to do that if you don't have the access rights. So under Location, we can double click to open that. And then under Forms and Form Numbers, we just need to have a tick and prompt user for cancellation for the reason. So that's the reason it's coming up for me is because I've got that ticked in there. So it's prompt user for reason for cancellation under the forms form numbers tab. Once you've ticked that you can set up the reasons or alter the reasons by going into set up appointment and cancellation reason. I've got those two there but you can make new reasons by just clicking on the blank white page giving it a unique code and the reason there. So that might drive some people crazy, but some people need to capture those and like capturing those reasons. Um, if you do do that, you can then report on those cancellations by going to Report, Appointments and cancellation, Appointment Cancellations. You can then report out on all of those things for patients, non-patients both, and choose your date range. You could even just do it for one individual patient if you want to search for that patient one individual provider, so that's all configurable. I'm not sure if you can print that to the actual, yes you can You can actually print that to the report manager as well, so it saves you printing it out to paper if you want to just print that to the report manager. It would then um, allow you to go into report and report manager and view that report just from in here. Uh, patient register, so I'm on page three of the handout, I'm just going to close some of these windows here. Just by the way, a, a nice little shortcut for closing windows is Control F4, that's a nice little shortcut, saves you using your mouse, Control F4 closes all the windows that are open. Now patient register, F3, we can look at the audit tab of the patient register, and in version 20 there was some enhancements made that made this a little bit um, more full with the audit, you can see there's some more things that it records here and it gives a bit more detail of what um, an old value was and a new value. Okay, um, you can see things for enrolment, address and they were always there but it's just been enhanced a little bit with version 20. Now um, I just want to talk about family address copy and I'm just going to get this patient Charles up on the palette and um, what I'll do is if I want to change his address to something like um, Avenue, Avenue and I'll just click OK. Now if he has five people in the family, you don't want to go and change an address like that for those five different people. You can use family address copy by going to the patient register menu and family address copy. 
it's brought up the other family members and they're all, they've all got um, Coastlands Road on it. I want that to be updated to the new one of Coastlands Avenue and I can just tick or untick those things here to see who this is going to be applied to and choose OK. And then um, when I search for any of those patients, you'll see that uh, perhaps they've all changed avenue now from road. So that's just a nice quick way of making sure all those things have been changed. Now another little thing is that um, in version 20, when you do that change um, and go to the screen audit and address, you'll see here that now when you have changed things via the um, family address copy, it is actually picking that up. So prior to version 20 it wasn't picking up those changes if they'd been done via the family address copy. Philippa, I have a couple of questions here. Um, do, would you like to take them now? Yes, yep, sure. Okay. When family address copying, does it still copy the home number also? Um, I have had that suggestion before. And so we've got that in as a software improvement suggestion to actually make that work. So I'm sorry about that. Yep. We will raise it again and make sure that that goes in in a future release. Was that all there, Gordon? I think that's it, yes. Um, Great. Uh, I've got a few others which I'll handle now in a couple of minutes. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, so um, the next thing that I want to talk about is the chart numbers. So you'll see that um, family members are linked together by having the same chart number. And these are automatically allocated when you do a family add. So when you're actually doing a, a family add to add a new family member, it will automatically assign that chart number to all members of the family. And that's why when you go to patient and family tree or to that icon on your toolbar, you'll see all the members of the family there because you see they've got that same chart number. Now it's very simple matter if you want to unlink anybody or link anybody else and that's not in there, just to go in and manually change that chart number to be the same as or different depending on what you want to do. Okay, um, family community services card copy, so just on page 4 and 5.4. Um, when the, a family member has updated their community service card number, again just quite a long number there that's usually preceded with five zeros. If you've changed that for one family member rather than gone to each individual family member that's linked to that person, um, again just go to patient register and family CSC copy and it will again prompt you which other ones you want to change that to and you can click OK um, to, to just change that. Um, okay, now, so the instructor... Okay, just a, a couple more questions before, um, before we move on. Um, yep. I've got one from Sandra Hawkins here which says, can we have the option to copy the cell phone number when doing address copy? Maybe tick the children to copy mum's cell phone number. Um, lots of work for a family of six to add cell phones individually. Oh, okay. Okay, I think that could be a valid software improvement suggestion. Um, I'll certainly put that forward. Thanks for that. Okay, okay. and one more just while we're here. Um, when a patient comes up enrolled elsewhere, um, however they are still enrolled with us, how do we manually change um, to fund it again? How do you manually change to, to fund it again? Well, then it would be a matter of going in and um, Update. Oh, you can, yeah. So that's their funding. Are they talking about their funding status? Is this a is this a typed question? Yep. Okay. Um, well, the funding status you can't normally change that. It's normally greyed out because that's done when you do your PHO import. And normally this is all greyed out. You can't manually change it. It's controlled by doing a PHO import. And so all you can do is get them to sign the form again, re-update here and here and here and then um, submit your register again. If anybody does want to, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's a good idea to change that funding status manually. You, there is a setting and location set up that you can um, be allowed to change those things but I don't think it's recommended. So it's a matter of just getting them to sign the form again and um, then submitting your register the next time. Okay, that's it from me for now. Thanks, Gordon. 
Okay, um, so we've done family CSC copy, still on page four, looking at invoicing and payments number six. Um, so annotations within the invoice screen, if I just come into here. And just be aware that you can put annotations in to either annotate an individual service or subsidy, and you can also put an annotation into the whole invoice. And whatever you type in there, um, it will print out on the invoice depending on what kind of setup that you've got for your account group. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so you can just put annotations in through there. You can also put the annotations into a payment, whether that payment is linked to the invoice or done individually. There's the annotation there. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about is the importance of actually allocating a payment within, um, you know, allocating a payment to an invoice when you're putting a payment through on its own. So if I just put in an uh, FH and pay something off, method is cash. It's really important to always encourage the staff to go to allocate. And even if there's only one thing there, just actually ticking that to say that I'm allocating this payment to this invoice here. It's really important for resolution and just um, accounting purposes. So if I click OK, now when I go into Shift F9 for our account holder account, you can see that there will always be a resolution tab on each of those things. So if I open the payment, I can see the resolution tab and that payment is linked um, to the invoice that we paid off and vice versa. If I go to the invoice and go to the resolution tab, you can see that that's linked to the payment that we put in. So it is just a nice thing to encourage the uh, staff to do that because it helps with the whole balancing, etc. Um, talking about what gets printed on an invoice, that's controlled by account groups. So just looking at 6.3. And um, oh, just before we do that, another thing I want to point out that a lot of people perhaps get stuck on when they first, especially when they first start using MedTech, is what am I seeing here? I'm seeing just the September things. If I want to look back into archived things, I can click on the filter, the little rainbow icon, and I can include archived transactions and choose OK. So then I'm getting these older things in here. So that's really important to remember that um, if you want to see older transactions, click on the filter and include the archived transactions. Um, now, just coming back to what gets printed on an invoice, etc., in a statement, we first of all need to see what's the account group that that patient actually belongs to. They belong um, to the registered patient account group. So in their F3 patient register, their account group is registered patient. Okay, you'll find probably there's a one account group that most of your patients belong to. There's other options in there such as corporate, bad data, visitor, etc. Now to control what you uh, do here, what you see in that, it's a matter of going to the setup menu, accounting and account group. So if we want to have a look and see what the settings are for the invoices etc for, for a registered patient account group we can double click on that and you can see um, there's things here relating to whether or not they get charged an admin fee on their statements, um, what their default descriptions are for invoices, credit notes and payments and then in the individual invoice tab you get the choice of what kind of invoice you want to print. So is it a standard invoice or is it a detailed invoice? And of course detail will show more detail about what you want to print out on that. Um, it may be a matter of just going in and changing that and just printing one out and seeing which one you prefer if, you, if you're not sure which one you want to use. Also the um, show account balance, do you want to show the account balance on the invoice? And suppress reversals is a good one to have on because otherwise every time you delete a uh, transaction, uh, if you don't have that ticked, it's going to show a dirty great line through that on the invoice, which isn't very nice. Um, and you can have a tick and suppress nil if you want as well. And put in things in your invoice message line. So this is um, requiring access rights to get into this, so you just need to be um, aware that if you're not able to get into that, the practice manager may need to do that. All right, going on to the next page, five, and uh, we've done that part there. So 
I want to go back to the uh, account holder screen, so I'm going to shift F9, and in here, again if I just include the archive, if I want to go back and print anything, an individual transaction, I can highlight that, and previously, prior to version 20, you would need to highlight that, go up to the account menu, and choose print single invoice receipt. Now in version 20 there's now a shortcut for that which is control I, so you don't need to go to the menu, you can just highlight that and choose control, click on control I and it will print that highlighted transaction. Just a simple thing but it may just save people a bit of time. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I just want to talk about is this menu here, probably if you've used MedTech for a while you probably already know this, but this menu here is the dynamic menu that changes depending on what window you're in. So between module and report, this menu will change relevant to the window you're in. Account holder shows account. If I press F3 and make that the active window, then that changes to patient register. If I press F7 for accounts, that changes to appointment book. So when there's instructions to do something and that menu's not there, that you're looking for, it's because you just haven't got that actual as your highlighted active window. Okay, um, just coming back to the account holder again, and um, some other enhancements that were made in version 20, 6.5, talking about new filters available. So you can filter by service provider by clicking into the, uh, the rainbow filter icon, and you can choose an individual provider that you want to show their transactions. So I'm looking here, that's all one provider there anyway. Um, let me see if I can find another patient, perhaps Arnie. He's our favourite test patient. Arnie, if we include his archive transactions. Okay, so he's got uh, quite a few transactions and they're mostly for SFE, um, but there's just one there for beta. So if I wanted to filter that and change the provider to beta, they will show me just the transactions for beta. The balance will still reflect everything from all providers, um, but you can either have it at all or one individual one. So that's an enhancement that came out in version 20. Another enhancement in that filter is that you can have a look back range of um, a certain thing here, so transaction range. Now just note that I'm not able to actually activate that unless I untick the include archive transaction. So that has to be unticked and then you can say from here, just come back to here, and you can say a certain range and it will put that in there for you. The default range in here is actually for um, it's actually for six months, and that default range in your transaction range is set by your um, location setup and the accounting details. Okay. Any other questions there, Gordon? Uh, no, not not as now. Okay, great. All right. Well, we're page five out of ten, so and it's halfway through, so we seem to be going on tracks. So that's good. Um, stock items, page five. Set up of stock items and stock tracking within the invoice screen. Now some people may already be using this, but a lot of people this is an unknown thing that um, they're not sure about and it could be quite useful. So when I go to set up accounting and services, again you need access rights to, to be here, I'm going to type in C and go to create bandage. This is a stock item, so I've made it quantity based and a non-consultation service and in the stock tab we've ticked that it's a stock item. So you have the ability to put on how much, how much stock that you've got on hand, what the minimum stock level is and who the supplier is, product number, cost price etc. So note here that um, with these settings we've got 35 uh, crate bandages on hand. If I click OK and do an invoice for a crate bandage, because I made it quantity based, I can put in that we've got two of those and it calculates that that's $11. I can click OK. Now if I come back to here, you'll notice that it would have deducted 
those two that I just invoiced from the stock on hand. So it's a nice way to track what you've got and how that stock's going, making sure it's been invoiced, etc. Another nice thing in here is that with your um, reports, you can go to Report Accounting Stock and you can do an, a stock order report or a stock valuation report. So we click on that. Again, remember your help button, so pressing the F1 function to see a little bit more information relevant to wherever you are, and there, there's the accounting stock order telling us what that does. Okay, so that's quite useful if you've got stock that you want to use, have a look at those instructions on that handout and you may be able to utilise that. All right, so that is actually page five and six. Any questions on that? No, no questions. Great. All right, let's move on. We're on page seven. We're going to talk about outbox date range filtering, and I'm just going to make sure I've got the right patient on the pallet because I need to have somebody with the right inbox result. Now, this came out, I think, maybe a year or two ago, and it's relevant to when you're doing an outbox document and using the wizard. So I'll just talk you through. I go on to Control F2. That's the shortcut for a document. You can type in um, the actual document code, which I'm going to use Ref A4. I've put a little note into your handout that if there's any documents that you don't have and you'd like to download, there's a link there to our website and you can download specific documents from there. So take a look at that um, if you're interested in downloading any of these um, Outbox documents on our website. Right, so back to here, if we want to look at Wizard to insert any clinical notes or past history, um, any inbox things that we've got, this is what I'm talking about here with the date range filtering. So um, if you want to filter this list, because you know if you're wanting to just get some specific stuff here, you don't want to be looking at screeds and screeds of things, so you can use this date range filtering by clicking the date from, typing in the date, so I could say I just want to filter this list down to show 01, 03, 97, and the date 2 is going to be 30, 05, 97. Okay, now the important thing here is that you've got to click load because it won't filter it until you've clicked load. So I click on that and it brings my list down to a nice filtered list to between those dates there. So that could save you a lot of scrolling and ticking and clicking. Now from here, instead of going through and ticking all of those, use your right mouse click functionality. So right mouse click on there and you can choose select all and it'll tick all of those for you. Or you can right mouse click and you can say unselect all. You could also say, well, actually I don't want that one and that one, but I want all the others. So you tick the ones you want, you right mouse click and you invert it, so it unticks the ticks and vice versa. So <clears throat> when we click on that and then just insert, it's going to insert that information into our document. Um, the instructions for that on page 7. Okay, now I'm going through very quickly. All right, um, new toolbar icon for scanning, and that is, again, I'm just bringing in a couple of things that came in in version 20, and um, you can add that to your toolbar, and uh, that's a good savings because if you, before that you would have to go to module, inbox, and scanning, which is a little bit of a long way around, so you can now add that icon to your toolbar if you don't always have it, already have it, by going to Windows, Toolbar, Setup, and if you haven't got it, you can choose the things that you do want from the left hand side, and single arrow them across to the right hand side. You can also make an order out of your toolbars, toolbar icons by highlighting the one you want, and moving it up, and down, etc. Another icon that you can add, which is fairly new, it's not version 20, but it's about a, a year or so old, um, is the day book icon. So if you want to, we always encourage people to print their day book at the end of each day, so you look at any, um, any issues, any exceptions, etc. 
uh, before you do your banking and if you get your, your day book right then your banking should be right. So it's nice to have that icon, it's a little brown book with a, with a D on there. Uh, that saves you a little bit of clicking because um, otherwise it's module, accounting, auditing and day book. So it is quite nice to have that icon on your toolbar, especially if you're the practice manager. Um, just on page 8 and number 11 is contact support. So under the help menu, again reasonably new, uh, about a year or a couple of years old, is that rather than ringing the help desk or ringing into MedTech, you can actually just go to the help menu and choose contact support. You can put your request, support request in here and click OK, making sure that you know all your details are right, etc. This is reflected from your staff login. And um, click OK, it'll come through and they can con the support team can contact you afterwards. You can also do that for a training request, any license queries, and you can see here as well that you've got include license, so it would attach that if you want a license query, and um, sales queries, manage my health queries. So that's just another method of being able to contact MedTech. Uh, where are we up to? Number 12 on page 8, Attachments Manager. Using the Attachments Manager is useful if you want to attach a photo or an ECG or any kind of file at all. You can attach that through the Attachments Manager and you can get to that through the paperclip icon if you've got that on your toolbar. If you don't have that on your toolbar, you can go to Module, Inbox and Attachments Manager. What you do then is you would then create a new link by clicking the blank white page and you would go off and you can see there's the ellipsis there, the three dots, you can click on that and you can scroll to find uh, the attachment that you want. Now normally you would be uh, using a shared drive because it's only really relevant to do this if you've got a shared network drive because you want every person that's accessing MedTech to be able to see this uh, file. If you just use something from your C drive, then nobody else is going to have access to that. So it's really important to make sure you're browsing to a shared network drive. Now, um, under my documents, where's my pictures? Sorry, I'm just going to go back up one. Here we are, my pictures. And um, so whatever picture it is, not terribly relevant, but I've got a picture of the desert there. I'm going to click on open and just give it a name, test2. Okay, it tells me the file size as well there. So all this is is a link to that file, whatever it is, an ECG, like I said, a photo, whatever. Um, so then once you've got that link there, you can just tick, click it and it opens up that attachment. Now, as I said, you can get to that through the Attachments Manager. Within the Patient Manager and Inbox, uh, there is the little paperclip icon there. So if they've got an attachment, that icon will be in the Inbox. All right, um, looking at clinical keywords, I'm sure a lot of you know about this already, but for the benefit of those who don't, um, the clinical keywords is a way of using um, just a few letters, uh, a full stop and a couple of letters to expand something out into full text definition. So when you're in F9, for example, if we go to annotations, we can use clinical keywords in here, to use the right one here, and you could use, uh, say for example, you wanted to say this is a long consultation, you don't want to type that out in full, we use a clinical keyword by putting a full stop in, the abbreviation, which in this case is LC, so all I've done is type the full stop LC and then I can press the space bar or enter and it expands that out to the full description of the keyword. So I can use that in invoices, I can use it in outbox documents. So if, again if I bring up my referral and click into here, if I put in a uh, full stop and LC space it'll expand out, there's another one that I've got is dot bn, this is a clinical one, space, and it puts that whole thing out um, into the full expanded description. And um, 
they can use that or doctors can use that in consult notes as well. So under F12 they can use the clinical keywords as well. .bn and space. So how do you set those up? You go to set up clinical and keywords. Even though it's relevant for admin as well, you go you go through set up clinical keyword. And in here, once again, remember to use your F1 help and um, you can view where it is that these can be used and how they're used. Um, add keywords, delete keywords, etc. So F1 will give you help relevant to where you are. Now if I just come down to L, see there's that, the abbreviation was LC and there's the uh, description is long consultation. If I go to B, we've got that back examination and when I type full stop BN, it expanded out to that. So if you want to add any more, um, we can click on blank white page and put in a unique keyword just a couple of letters usually and the full description there. Now I know um, people that are using this already are saying, you know, we'd, a lot of the software um, feedback that we get is can we make that description longer and that's definitely in the pipeline. So we're looking at expanding that description. So watch the space and hopefully um, very soon you'll be able to see that you can put more into that description because sometimes people want to put a couple of paragraphs worth in there. So instructions for there on page 8. Um, oh, the other thing is that you can also use those uh, into notes field of the appointment book and um, dot lc once again and space and it'll let you now put that into the uh, note field. I think that's just a version 20 thing. I don't think you can do that prior to version 20. Now just on the appointment books again, we're coming close to the end of the time. Um, see if I can fit this in here. So procedures, you'll notice that I've got procedures in my appointment book and um, that's an extra column within here. Now if I make an appointment for Junior or James, um, I can notice that all these appointment slots are 15 minutes long. I've got some predefined procedures in here such as perhaps um, driver's medical. So if I click on that and press tab, see what it does is it's actually, that's a 30 minute appointment slot and has expanded that automatically out into 30 minutes. So again, I'll just show you once more. So if we put Mickey Mouse in there and give him a procedure of pilot's medical, we're at 15 minutes as soon as I press tab, it will change the duration to 30 minutes. So if you haven't got this already and you do want it, that is a free license thing that you can go through help and register. And if you don't have procedures ticked and you do want it, all you need to do is print that uh, registration out, write on it that you'd like procedures, fax or scan and email it in and we can send that out to you. Once you've got your registration, enter it in and then come in to set up appointment and procedures and add your procedures in here. So you can do um, a description, unique code, patient gender, so if it's a smear for example you might just want it relevant to females, which providers is it relevant to and what time slot is it. So once you've done that there's all sorts of nice things you can do with um, reporting etc. Okay, we have an interesting question here. Um, if F9 is selected then show outstanding only, why do we see a lot of zero invoices as well as, outs as the outstanding? If F9 is selected, mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. If Shift F9 is selected, is it? Maybe Shift F9, yeah, perhaps all the, yeah, Shift F9. So it's what's like it saying? Show outstanding only. Hmm. Why do we see a lot of zero invoices as well as the outstanding? Well, I think that comes back to the account group. I think just check the account group through set up accounting and account group and just making sure in here that um, suppress nil is ticked. I think that's what, that, that should fix that error. That should fix that issue. So when you're doing invoices, check the account group and make sure you've got suppress nil and statements is um, suppress nil as well. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So oh, I think right. um, it's, it's been an hour. All right, we'll leave it there. So thanks for everyone for attending.